is in Isaiah 45 in just a minute. <clears throat> I appreciate the singing this morning. I've enjoyed every single song. It's been a real blessing to my heart. <clears throat> I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. And I want you to know burdens are lifted at Calvary. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're here to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. He's already been bruised. We may be bruised, but he's already been bruised. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank the Lord for it. Our third message on the seven doctrines are teachings that enable the believer to live a more powerful and vibrant Christian life was on the teaching of responsibility. In light of the scriptural teaching, we defined responsibility as the believer's acceptance of responsibility for every word, thought, word, actions, and motives. Thoughts, words, actions, and motives. Accepting responsibility for your or mine, thoughts, words, actions, and motives. Accept that responsibility. In the financial world, it is defined as the ability to answer a payment. A commitment was made to borrow money, and the borrower is responsible for the payment. So there's a responsibility of the borrower to pay the payment, as well you know. We can all associate with that kind of responsibility. But when it comes to our thoughts, words, actions, motives, it seems like it's a little different. It seems like we have a little harder time accepting responsibility for those things when we can accept responsibility like financially. But we do still have the responsibility whether we have a hard time or not. Can you really say that you can and will and want to and desire to take responsibility for your thoughts, words, actions, and deeds. I wonder if we can actually say that. Now, here's the problem. And I'm always coming up with a problem. And we've got to do that, I guess, to see the white. You've got to show the black, show the white. But anyway, here's the problem. We can see somebody else when they have the wrong thought. We might not see their thoughts, but we hear it in their words. Their thoughts come out in their words because out of the abundance of heart and mouth speaks. So we see and hear other people, we can say, uh-huh. So we can hold other people accountable for their thoughts, words, actions, and motives. But we don't think about it when it comes to our own self. In fact, we hold other people to a high degree of accountability. What we should do as well is to hold our own selves accountable for our own thoughts, words, actions, and motives. This holding yourself accountable, called responsibility, is the sign of a growing believer. A believer who will not accept responsibility for thoughts, words, actions, and motives, that person is stagnant. They're not growing. In our study last time, we, uh, we had just about 15 minutes last Sunday, we narrowed the subject matter down to the area of offenses and forgiveness. Because it seems like when it comes to thoughts, words, actions, and motives, it revolves around other people. Other people offend us, we offend other people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this idea of offenses even received or given and the idea of forgiveness. Do we ask forgiveness? Do we not ask forgiveness? In that line of thinking last Sunday, I gave you four things that we ought to do from the Lord himself, from Isaiah 45. In verses 21 through 23, I gave you these four things, but let me give you the verses first. Isaiah 45 21 through 23, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. 
Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. A famous evangelist pastor was saved by hearing that one verse. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Verse 23 is where I got four things last Sunday. Read that verse 23 again. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow every tongue shall swear. Here's the four things that I got out of verse 23. Number one, God swears or vows within himself. That's what God does. That's what God's doing. Here is God being a responsible God. First of all, this responsible God swears within himself. Second of all, God speaks with words of righteousness. So he swears or makes a vow. Or, and then he speaks with words of righteousness. And then third, he surrenders the will of others. In other words, he's not necessarily surrendering his will We'll find that later about the Lord Jesus Christ, but not right now. But he acts in such a way that others surrender their will. So in other words, his thoughts, words, actions, and motives causes other people to surrender their will. So he surrenders the will of others. And then the fourth thing in that passage is that he seeks the worship of others. So I didn't purposely make a outline, but it's a pretty good one. He swears within himself. He speaks with words of righteousness. He surrenders the will of others and he seeks the worship of, of others. So that verse again says it like this. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. In other words, his word is not void. It's not empty words. These are real words that have import and importance and impact and they don't return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. That return means in a negative way. Now that's the way we should act. We should act like God. When we accept responsibility for thoughts, words, actions, and motives, we should act like God. When it comes to uh, our thoughts, words, actions, motives, we should vow within ourselves. Say something inside of us, in our hearts, about this thing, our responsibility of thoughts, words, actions, and motives. Vow within your heart. And then we should say to ourselves, I'm going to speak words of righteousness that will not return. In other words, it's not like a rumor that boils and rolls around and around and comes back some way or another. It it's goes out like an arrow. Goes out like a bullet. And here this word goes out and it does not return. It is sure word. Man, we've got a whole lot of things to say right there. But we should speak with right words. So we make up our mind in our hearts. We swear or vow within ourselves. And then we speak. Right words. And then we should make an example like God did for others to follow. In other words, when we do right, others follow suit. In other words, they will surrender their will to what we are doing. You say, preacher, that is amazing that a person would actually surrender their will to you because of what you are doing. It's not actually surrendering the will to you, but surrendering to God. But you can cause other people to surrender by the way you accept responsibility. There are a lot of people who have never, ever surrendered their will. I wonder about those strong wills. They have written books about strong will child. Dobson, Dobson did. Uh, Dobson did that. And I wonder about the strong-willed individual having never surrendered their will. That's a thought. I'll leave it there. But then that last part of this verse says they, he desires others to worship, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. In other words, other people bow down and worship God. And so I'm asking myself, as I accept responsibility of my thoughts, words, actions, and motives, is that responsibility that I'm taking on, is that responsibility causing other people to worship God? I'm thinking about that. The Bible says accepting responsibility is a great way to lead others to Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 2.12, something like this. 
Work out your own salvation. That's not the whole verse. It's part of the verse. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Well, you say, preacher, I don't have to work out my own salvation. God has done it all through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid it all. That's right. As far as our salvation is concerned, Jesus said it is finished. He did everything necessary for our salvation. All of it's done is complete. And not only has he done everything for us to be saved from hell and saved from sin, he's done everything necessary for us to have complete victory over sin in our daily life. Jesus has done it all and it's finished. He get, we have all the power that is necessary, all the grace that is necessary to live for him. Got all of it. He's made it, it's all done. It's complete. Finished. Finished work. He said it is finished. But when it comes to us, it's not finished. He said, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. In other words, we've got something to do about it. Well, what do we have to do? I, I'm just sitting here and I'm saved. I, I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's all I got to do. I can do anything else I want to do. I don't have to surrender my will. I don't have to take responsibility for nothing. I'm saved and I'm not going to hell and that's all I care. I've just got salvation and Jesus Christ is a fire escape. I got news for you folks. A person that's just got Jesus Christ as a fire escape and something might be wrong with their salvation. Salvation is not just a fire escape. Salvation is a life to be lived for Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So work out your own salvation. He has done it all, but we haven't done it all. Our success as a believer is brought, bought and paid for by Christ. Success is a gift. Successful Christian living is a gift. But somebody's got to open that gift and use it. You can have the gift all you want to, but you've got to open it up and use it. And accepting responsibility for thoughts, words, and actions and motives is working out your own salvation. It's unwrapping the gift of salvation. The first thing we must do is to take responsibility in this matter of offenses. How do we react to offenses from others? If I were to ask you right now how many of you have ever been offended, I promise you every hand would go up. And then if the truth were known, I could say this. How many of you have ever offended anybody? And if the truth were known, you'd say, I've done that too. I know I have. You didn't need to say amen there right there. How do we react to the offenses of others? Whether those offenses are un intended or unintended, and the way we react can be a blessing or it can be a blight. A blight to what? A blessing to what? A blessing to your soul. A blight to your soul. A plague to your soul if you react wrongly. A famine to your soul if you react wrongly. But blessing and bountifulness and joy and happiness if you react toward offenses according to the Bible. I don't know a person here that wouldn't say, Preacher, I want God's blessings. Every single one of us here would say, I want God's blessings. Well, let me give you a passage of scripture to start with when it comes to this matter of offenses. In Matthew 18, 15, here's what it says. Uh, most of you probably know about this verse. But in case you don't know, Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, that's saved when it says brother, so that's a saved person. And, and I guess you could go ahead and put that out there for anybody. But this is specifically about thy brother, the saved person. But more if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now, I know what we do. You, you don't have to. Preacher, you don't have to tell me this. I know we do it. I know. I know. We all do it. 
we say, somebody offended me and I'm going to tell his fault to others. Is that what the Bible says? Go tell his fault to others? Did the Bible say that? No, it didn't say that. It says, go tell him his fault to him. And to him alone. It made it clear. It said, and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. In other words, this is a way to gain the friendship or the forgiveness of a brother in Christ. This verse gives us a godly response when we are offended. We are told to go to that offender privately and share the supposed offense to him. By the way, a lot of people say something like this. They get this kind of backwards. They say, okay, I'm going to take that verse, and if, if I think I've offended somebody, I'm going, to go, <coughs> I'm going to go over to this person. I'm going to say, if I have offended you, <coughs> how many of you know that when you say if, you already messed up? If I have offended you, you rascal, you know you did. And I know I did. There's no if about it. Don't say if. There's no doubt about it. You did. <clears throat> you say, preacher, I don't like that kind of preaching. Well, this is accepting responsibility for my thoughts, words, actions, and motives. <clears throat> if this action of going to your brother privately is taken quickly, you can solve a lot of problems. Now, why did you say quickly? Because Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because sentence against an evil worker is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, as soon as possible, go to that brother. As soon as possible, go to him. Not doing the will of God in this matter of offenses will make our hearts to follow an evil path. I'll promise you, when you put this off and procrastinate about this, your heart will go down the wrong path. Doing the will of God in this matter makes our hearts follow the paths of righteousness. And our great shepherd said that he would lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That means for his glory. You say, I want to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Well, then follow what he said. Go to thy brother privately. <clears throat> you know what? When the great shepherd says, I'll lead you in paths of righteousness, the great shepherd is treating us like sheep. Uh, sheep is not a wonderful animal for us to be compared to just to be honest with you but let me tell you this the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray in other words we're just prone to do it and we need to do what the sheep do they follow the shepherd that's one thing they do right they follow the shepherd so before you think before you say before you act, before you devise motives that are not proper, follow the shepherd first and go to thy brother in private. Go to the offending person, believer in this passage, before any evil root begins to entwine and encircle and choke your Christian life like the honeysuckle vine chokes out other plants and like an ivy vine would ch choke out the life of a tree. You get rid of this problem by simply doing what Jesus said, go to thy brother. Don't let evil thoughts <clears throat> get in your heart. Now how in the world can I do this? I got a few minutes. How in the world can I do it? Well, I'm going to tell you how we can do things like this. These are hard things. These are not easy things to do. And I, listen, I'll promise you that in your Christian experience, there's probably been one time in 20 years that you've ever done what I'm preaching. One time in 20 years. 
You say, Preacher, I, I, I know that there's been offenses one way or another over the past year. And I didn't do this. That's right. All of us can say that. We ought to do it. We ought to follow the shepherd. But how can we do it? By the grace of God, we can do it. How many of you believe that? By the grace of God, we can do these spiritual things. Now, I, got, I got news for you. <clears throat> It takes the grace of God to do a spiritual work. And that's why it's so important. If it were easy to do, if it were humanly possible, if it was just something that we could master up in our own strength and in our own mind, it wouldn't be godly. But it takes God and his grace to help us do what is right. And God's grace is there for us. <clears throat> the grace of God will enable every believer to accept this responsibility when responding to an offender. Let me read some scriptures as I try to wrap this up. Young men, likewise, this is Titus 2, and verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Put that in everyday words. Exhort employees to be obedient to employers. That they may, you see, you see uh, and to please them well, and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. That's how to make God get glory. That's how to lead people to Christ. By the way you act toward your employer. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Titus 2.11. Boy, if you don't know that verse, you ought to memorize it. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Salvation initially when you accepted Christ and salvation progressively as you live every day. Grace of God will help you do that. And then it says, here's what the grace of God will do. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what the grace of God will do. This wonderful, powerful truth of accepting responsibility for thoughts, words, actions, and motives can be done. We can do it by the grace of God. <clears throat> I'm skipping some things. <coughs> I have to get down here where I, my last thoughts are. How many of you remember in John chapter 21 where John uh, and Peter and Jesus were together and the Lord says to Peter, lovest thou me? How many of you remember that story? Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? You know what? Peter got a little bit aggravated, didn't he? He got a little bit mad. Here's the Savior telling him, Peter, do you really love me? And so here's what, here's what I'm saying right now. This is the thought. When it comes to this matter of accepting responsibilities for thoughts, words, actions, and motives, you say, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. Well, I want to ask you this. Do you really love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? A person that loves Jesus wants to do what Jesus said to do. And then you know what Peter said? Peter looks over at John and says, what about this guy? Who's the one that betrayed? In other words, he's throwing doubt on John, the beloved, his brother in Christ. Said, well, what about him? Who is he that betrayed thee? Well, what are you going to do about him? You know what Jesus said? This is basically something like this. That's none of your business. Oh. So here's what the Lord's doing. He's saying, Peter, you love me? Yep. Then feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter, you do your job, and I'll do mine. Is that what the Lord's saying? Peter, you do your job, and I'll do mine. What's my job? Whatever John needs, whatever John's future is, Whatever John's done, that's my responsibility. That's not your responsibility. Did you hear that? 
The Lord is saying, you leave John out of the picture, Peter. You do what I tell you to do. Leave John out. <laughs> oh, but we want to be like Peter. Lord, what about that one? What about that one? What about that one? The Lord said, hold it. You love me? Feed my sheep. Love me? Feed my sheep. Love me? Feed my sheep. Just leave your responsibility. Take your responsibility that the Lord has given you and leave God's responsibility to him. Amen? Amen. That's good preaching. <clears throat> Well, we sang a while ago the song, He Giveth More Grace. We sang one part of it, one verse of it. It's actually got three verses. The Bible says in James 4, 6, part of it says, but he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. James 4, 6. That song was written by Annie Johnson Flynn. From this passage of scripture, James 4, 6. He giveth more grace. And of course we sang some of those words. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials his multiplied peace. This is what grace can do. Verse 2, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's forgiving is only begun. In other words, when we reach the end, he just begins. I like that. That makes me want to shout. How many of you sometimes think you've reached the end? But God just beginning to work. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> but verse 3 is not in the book. Here's another verse. An unknown verse. Fear not thy need. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting availing. The Father both thee and thy load will upbear. And then the chorus, of course, we sang. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That's the grace of God. That will help you accept responsibility for thoughts, words, actions, and motives. Well, what about Annie Johnson Flint? Oh, preacher, she was probably some fantastic, wonderful, lovely, vibrant, healthy young lady. No. Annie Johnson Flint was born into the family of <clears throat> Johnson's and... Uh, Soon as the mother had uh, Annie, then there was another sister to come along, and that sister was born, and the mother died. Now, Annie was just a couple of years old when her mother died. Her father, a Baptist, gave Annie Johnson and the sister to a couple called the Flints because he couldn't raise them. He wanted them to be raised in the Baptist faith. And there's a, a part of that story is that another family member took them for a while and the Flints were friends of that family, knew them, and finally they got involved and took the girls. Annie Johnson Flint was always good with verse or writing poetry, even as a young teen. And so her verses were known. But then she went to a school and trained to be a teacher and when she was training to be a teacher she all of a sudden started developing the arthritis young lady young lady and then while she was developing arthritis the Flints both of them passed away and here is Annie Johnson Flint and her sister trying to make it on their own and she's trying to write verses and she's trying to teach but she can't because of the arthritis that's crippling her body. Finally, she's not even able to walk. And she's trying to do enough verse and prose to make a living and sell to different people. But times were hard, times were tough. And sometimes she couldn't make it. 
even make the living. But God would always seemingly provide. But then she ended up in a sanatorium. They had to pick her up and carry her and put her in a chair. And in order to write, <clears throat> they would take a pen or a pencil and stick it between her gnarled fingers. And she would write. That's the one who wrote, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. God's grace will help you more than you can ever know. And I'll tell you what it do. Not only help you in the afflictions like Andy Johnson Flint had, but God's grace will help you accept responsibility for thoughts, words, actions, and motives. If you'll allow God's grace to do so, he'll do it. You and I need the grace of God. Let's pray.